Okay. So if you're keeping score, we had lunch, then we had a talk on functional programming. Now we have a talk on architecture. So we're not doing you any favors in terms of keeping you awake. But that's okay, this is really a talk about microservices. Because I heard that if you give a talk about microservices that you actually get better feedback. So that's where we're going to go. In all seriousness, uh, this talk actually begins in a hotel bar where all good talks do uh, during the first Cloud Foundry Summit in 2014. And believe it or not, in 2014, it was possible to have a conference that had only two microservices talks on the entire agenda, as opposed to now everything is a, is a thinly failed microservices talk. But there's two of us, mine and one belonging to Russ Miles, who at the time was the chief scientist at Simplicity itself. And I, I strive to one day be a chief scientist. I mean, how cool would that be as a job title? Naturally, being the two microservices speakers, we decided that we're going to compare notes. And that was when I first encountered this philosophy that microservices actually have very little to do with modularity and everything to do with this uh, notion of anti-fragility. And Russ believed in the philosophy so much that he decided he was going to go write a book on it entitled Anti-Fragile Software. And he said, anti-fragile software is constructed from otherwise fragile components, but then by allowing the ongoing sacrifice of those fragile components in the face of stress, you allow the system as a whole to start to expect them, and you give it a mechanism to adapt to those stresses through the process of replacing the sacrificed components. And so we have systems where we're constantly replacing pieces all of the time. If you will, we are quite literally building the system that allows us to change the engines on the airplane while it's in flight. That's what we're trying to do. Now, much of the foundation for this idea is found in the book by the same name, Anti-Fragile, by Nassim Taleb. And uh, he is, uh, has an interesting career path of his own. He's a statistician and risk analyst turned mathematics researcher and philosopher. And his work focuses on problems of randomness, probability, and uncertainty. And he wrote other bestsellers, Fooled by Randomness, The Black Swan, you may have heard of those, both of which he says culminate in the Anti-Fragile book. So he even goes on to say that if you read Anti-Fragile, you don't need to read all of the other books. And he opens the book with the fundamental question, well, what is anti-fragile? Well, to define that, we need to define what is fragile. And I think we all know that, right? Fragile is we have a system or an artifact that we put stress on it. We take the glass pitcher and we throw it at the floor and what happens? It shatters. So we put stress on fragile objects, then we get damage, we get collapse, we get destruction. Cool. What's the opposite of that? We ask what the opposite of that is, and most of us are going to come up with one of these answers. We're going to say, okay, well, if I put stress on it, then it's not going to break. It's going to show integrity or resilience or robustness. And that's when we get shut down. He says, no, that's not it at all. The opposite of fragile is not it doesn't break. The opposite of fragile is, well, it actually gets better. We put stress on the system and it improves, it becomes stronger, it becomes more powerful. And so to talk about systems that have those types of characteristics, he actually invented the word anti-fragile. You don't really find it in our um, language before that point in time. Anti-fragile systems or artifacts thrive under chaos, and in fact many of them don't just thrive under chaos, they require continual exposure to stress in order to function optimally. Okay, so that's what anti-fragile is. Well, the next question is, well, what actually works that way? What in our experience can we point to that has those types of characteristics? Are there existing non-software systems that we can learn from to help us understand, well, how can we build software that way? 
And Taleb writes in the book about a lot of different areas. You've got political systems, economic systems, you've got the rise of cities and how they evolve, you've got technological innovation, you've got corporate innovation. Um, I want to focus in on three systems that I think will give us the most insight for what we do. First, you have the immune system. So, um, in an audience of this size, I figure there's quite a few parents, right? Who has kids? Okay. Lots of kids. Okay. Now, we start out, we have the small child, and um, we keep them at home for several weeks. And as long as nobody in the house is sick, everything's okay. Okay. And then we come to the time where the first time we actually take the child and we send them off to um, child care or school or something like that, and what's the first thing that happens to them? They get sick, right? Now, part of that is the natural correlation between young children and placing things in their mouth, right? We'll set that aside for just a second. When we get along and we're not exposed to germs, then obviously we don't get sick, but the first time we get exposed to them, we get sick because our immune system has not yet learned how to fight off invaders. And so we have to get exposed to antigens in order to produce antibodies so that when we see those antigens again, then the immune system can actually fight it off more quickly. Eventually, your kids, they keep going to school, but they stop getting sick all the time because the immune system is learning and it's actually getting better. And um, we can actually apply these same ideas to how we do testing in our systems. Um, I actually have an article that I linked to here that I wrote several years ago about the notion of instead of fixing bugs, we actually write tests to expose the fact that we have a bug and we make the test pass to fix the bug. And as soon as someone else reintroduces the bug, what happens? Well, yeah, the test catches that. And so we're actually building tests that function as antibodies in our systems. Then you've got the muscle system. Oops, too far. How do you build stronger muscles? You damage them. You exert them, you pump iron, and the process of building muscles is first damaging the muscles and then allowing them to repair themselves. So you're not actually building any muscle when you're at the gym. You're actually building muscle after you leave and go home and rest. Now, the funny thing about the muscle system is if you stop stressing it, not only do you not go further, you actually go in reverse. So muscles actually thrive under stress, and they do the opposite given too much rest. And then you start to look at other complex organic systems like ant swarms. Now, ants are obviously fragile, right? It takes almost zero effort for me to take out an ant. But ants, by following very simple rules, can build enormous intricate structures, first of all using dirt, but then also even their own bodies. So one interesting structure that ants will build is a raft. When a population of ants falls into liquid, the ants will quickly attempt to attach to other nearby ants. And as a raft forms, other ants wander around on the surface of the raft until they reach the edge and they attach themselves to the edge. The interesting thing about this structure is that it's comparable to Gore-Tex and actually repels water. So you see they're trying to sink the raft of ants, and it's very difficult to do so. So fragile ants, you have one ant in water, probably not going to live very long. You put a bunch of ants in water, and all of a sudden they're unsinkable. So we see that organic systems, the immune system, the muscular system, will often exhibit anti-fragile characteristics. And then we also see that organic communities, swarms of ants, can also exhibit anti-fragile characteristics. So it would be incredibly interesting if we could figure out to what degree can we make software systems more organic? And not necessarily that they are formed organically. 
There's been a great deal of research in that area showing how that we can actually do computation with organic molecules like DNA. But that's not what I'm talking about at all. Build software, continue to write the same type of code that we're writing now, but have the systems that we consume um, from that code exhibit the same qualities and behaviors that organic systems do. So to explore that a little bit, I'd like to explore an article that was written by Dick Gabriel. And this article is actually composed based on a talk that he gave um, in Hong Kong. So Gabriel um, at IBM Research, before that Sun Microsystems, very well known for work in the Lisp community. Um, also one of the few um, people that you see in the software business who also has a Master of Fine Arts in Poetry. So he goes into this essay called um, Design Beyond Human Abilities, and he talks about two ideas in the nature of software design. The first is this idea of ultra-large scale systems. And the second, the idea of system homeostasis. And I'm not gonna go into nearly the level of detail that he does, but we'll hit you know, some high notes just to get us a picture of software systems with organic characteristics. So we start with uh, an ultra-large scale system. How do you define that? Well, the first definition isn't that good. You know, one that's impossible to build because it exceeds some critical limit of today's software engineering technology. That's a self-defeating definition, right? It means that we'll never be able to create an ultra-large scale system because it will always be just over the horizon from where we are right now. Now, the second definition actually focuses on their purpose. Give users significant advantages against intelligent, motivated, and capable adversaries, and he lists foes or enemies, virus riders, competitors, and our adversaries also have access to technology of their own. And this actually starts to sound a little bit like what we're experiencing in the software industry right now in that so many companies that previously would have never called themselves software companies are starting to redefine themselves as software companies so that they can compete. And so now there's this software arms race, if you will, to figure out who can build the systems that give competitive advantage over uh, those that we're in the market with. So this is kind of interesting to us. Now he goes on this long tirade about well, what are the characteristics of a system like that? And I kind of have a, a collage here of different types of characteristics. And I just kind of want to walk through these a little bit to give you an idea of what it is that we're talking about. So obviously they're huge. They possess trillions of lines of code. Now when you think about trillions of lines of code, to get an idea of how much code that is, most estimates say that we only have written in the billions of lines of code in all of human history, okay? So trillions of lines of code, that's a lot of code. They're made up of a diversity of hardware and software components. You've got servers and clusters and containers and sensors. Some of that stuff self-organizing, some of that stuff is actually carefully designed. Um, some of it's legacy code. Uh, Gabriel goes on to say that if we see an ultra-large scale system in the next 20 years, components of that have already been written. So we've written code that's going to be part of an ultra-large scale system and yet we didn't even know we were trying to produce such a thing. You've got components coming and going, some of that's planned, some of that's unplanned, you've got real-time components, you've got embedded components, you've got distributed components. That's starting to sound a little bit similar to our experience right now. It's going to last for a long time. It's never going to be installed in the traditional sense, but it's going to grow in place while it's running. So that starts to sound a little bit like um, things we're trying to do right now. It has to continually change to meet new challenges, new adversaries. You're going to have to make changes while the system's running. You don't get to reboot the system. That sounds familiar. It's got to operate under emerging conditions that are rarely predictable. It's going to suffer continual failures as we upgrade things and downgrade things and we change configuration and it has to continue to operate while all those failures are taking place. It's going to be a system of systems. There's going to be no human being that can actually monitor or adjust it except at extremely coarse levels. 
So it mostly has to run autonomously, has no boundaries, interacts with the world in planned and unplanned ways. It's developed by diversity of teams, diversity of mandates, weak or little coordination. And so what do we get as a design? We get something that's inconsistent and has to tolerate inconsistency. And this is why he starts to talk about this notion of design beyond human abilities because we can't even comprehend of what a design like this might actually look like. Now, to get a sense of how large a system we're talking about, let's think in terms of Java classes. Um, by his estimation, an ultra-large scale system would be composed of roughly two and a half pages of distinct Java code from every person alive on the planet today. And that translates, we'll say, given an average class size of 200 lines into about 5 billion Java classes. Now, we'll talk about this city block here. This is from Salt Lake City, the first place that I gave this presentation. We'll say that each house in the block represents a class. And you've got about 33 houses in this block. So at that density, the ultra-large scale system would represent the area of the United States enclosed by that rectangle, where the entire rectangle has the same density of houses. That's the size of the system that we're talking about. And I did some rough map um, work this afternoon and managed to figure out that that's about the uh, scale of Europe that we're talking about that much code at that density. So how in the world do we build a system like that? Now the obvious first guess, right, is we just aggregate components or modules into a system like a jigsaw puzzle. We know how to build modules, we know how to build houses, so if we just aggregate a bunch of houses we get a city, right? Is that how cities actually come into being? So we'll take an example city. Let's consider what we'll say New York City is like and how did it get that way and show that a city cannot simply be described as an aggregation of components. So what do we know about New York City? Well, we know we've got multiple different independent systems for transportation and infrastructure, and all of those evolved independently from one another, and there was no actual central planning that said the roadways and the trains and the shipping ports should actually work in this specific way before we actually build anything. In fact, you've got multiple different ports of entry, and you've got the design of the city is actually driven by a bunch of different factors, uh, some of which are economic. If you think about a city the size of New York, a large fraction of the economy is just dedicated to feeding the people who are living there and working there. You've got a diversity of culture, you've got people who have come and gone, you've got their ancestors, you've got artisans, you've got craftspeople that have affected the, the, the culture of the city, you've got multiple languages being spoken. Sometimes, depending upon what part of the city you're in, you need a translator to communicate at all. You've got old buildings, you've got new buildings, and they weren't all made at once, they weren't made uniformly. You've got scales of size, cost, complexity, convenience. You've got governance, community services that maintain order, safety, keep the city running well. You've got old things being torn down, new things being built, damage being repaired, growing until its usefulness requires it not to. The important point to get is that there was no central planning. There was no architect sitting at the top saying, this is how we want the city to look. The people who founded the city could never have envisioned what it looks like now and we won't actually know what it's going to look like in 150 years. It's much more like an organic system that has evolved in the face of pressures and opinions and needs and wants and circumstances. So, how do we design a system like that? So Gabriel switches gears and he talks about this notion of meta-design spaces. Space number one is this idea that we're going to come up with the whole design before building. And we know what this is, right? This is waterfall. Now, it's hard to imagine 
that working? Because A, we haven't seen it work at that scale. We've barely seen it work at small scale or medium scale systems. And we would need much higher level of abstraction than we currently possess to be able to do something like this. And then it's questionable that we would be able to do it at all. Then you've got stepwise design. This is what we're trying to do right now. We've got agility. Now this is possible for the individual components, but there's a sense in which if you're thinking about a system of this scale, do we even know what incremental step is going to take us closer to the goal? In many cases, we build the next thing and we might have to build 10 or 20 or 30 or 100 or 1,000 next incremental steps before we can even meaningfully measure that we've gotten closer to where we're trying to get. And so there becomes this idea that, well, maybe planning in a system of this size is actually impossible. And so you come to design space three, which is there is no plan. We start to think about evolution as design. We start with something, we test it. If it's good enough, we stop. If not, we change it randomly and we test it again. And then we rinse and repeat that story in order to build the system. Now, does anybody actually build systems that way? Sure. Um, this is the realm of genetic algorithms and genetic programming, which is what I happen to do my uh, master's work in. And the interesting thing about genetic programming is that it can do a pretty good job. You can set forth a genetic program and we've, we've managed to take a system design that we're trying to produce and, and modify it randomly and move it toward a goal. And 15 times in the last few decades, we've managed to randomly evolve a previously patented 20th century invention. And six times we've been able to do that to an invention that was patented since 2000. And in fact, there are two instances where genetic programming has in fact created out of thin air, brand new, a patentable new invention based on the characteristics that go into what decides is this something that could have a patent or does it not. And so is it possible that as we start to get into this realm of deep learning and uh, frameworks, platforms like TensorFlow, that these could actually become the foundation of creating these ultra large scale systems? Of course, we have to be careful and make sure that we don't create Skynet. So the second thing that um, he talks about is this notion of homeostasis. What's that? A homeostasis we can define as we have a system that is in a steady state. Inputs are coming in, outputs are going out, and the system keeps itself in some form of equilibrium. It doesn't get overly stressed. It doesn't get overly understressed. Now, homeostasis has two different types of systems that we're concerned with. The first of those is what we call autopoietic systems. This is a system that is self-monitoring, self-correcting, self-repairing. And at their most extreme sense, we would consider it to be self-aware or uh, quasi-alive. So when we think about systems that look like this, we're thinking about systems that do function like the immune system or function like the muscular system. They are constantly repairing and replacing themselves. We don't really build many things that look like this. But then you've also got allopoietic systems. This is what we build. We build systems that produce something other than themselves. We don't actually care about building software, do we? We build software so that we can solve some business problem. And so the thing that we're delivering is a solution to the business problem. It just happens to be software. We write code so that we can produce something else. So if you start to think about continually, systems that continually recreate themselves versus systems that solve some business problem, those sound like very different types of code. And so 
thinking about solving problems the way we think about it, the abstractions are going to look very, very different. And so, writing autopoietic code in our current programming languages is going to be very hard to understand because they're not designed to think about that sort of problem. But because we need both, you know, we probably need to have additional tools, languages, frameworks, platforms that help us do that. Which brings us back then to the idea of anti-fragile architecture. So we say, okay, all this stuff that Dick Gabriel's talking about sounds cool, but we don't really see how we can do that type of stuff today. So what can we do with the tools that we have now to build these types of systems? Well, first of all, let's look at the stressors that software faces. First of all, you've got innovation. We want to produce new innovative systems. That is harder and requires more effort and puts more stress on us than actually just keeping the systems that we have alive. Some of those innovations are going to be successes. One of the worst possible things that can happen to a piece of software is for it to become successful. Because now, all of a sudden, it needs to work on more than just one machine. It needs to work on bigger machines and more machines and more users. And writing the code that can handle that kind of situation is harder than writing the code that doesn't have that many users at all. But then you've got market failure. You know, we build something that doesn't actually succeed in the market. And so what do we have to do? Well, we have to change the software and change the business model and figure out, well, what do we need to go build? And so that puts stress on the system. And then we've got the notion of failures. We have a machine that goes down. We have a network that goes down. We have a disk that fails or gets corrupted. And of course, this puts stress on the system. And most of the time, most of the software that we've written to date, if any of these things happens, the software crashes. It's not useful anymore. And then there's this notion of reuse. Reuse is one of the most terrible things that can happen to a piece of software that you've written. Hey, that library that you wrote, that's really cool. That's really useful. Let's make that the standard library for doing that type of work for all 10,000 developers in the company. When you have all of a sudden that pressure placed on it, it's no longer just a set of functions that's useful to you, it's now a set of functions that everybody depends on. And so that places stress on that particular system. And now you've got not just yourself as a product owner, you've got 10,000 other developers who are your product owners who are all saying, hey, can you add this feature? Can you change this behavior? Can you fix this bug? The common pattern across all of those stressors is change. Software has to constantly be able to thrive in the face of change. In fact, we might even argue if the darn users would just stop changing things, we wouldn't have any problems, would we? If you could just tell me what you want on day one, I build that and I can ship that and I'm done, no stress at all. That's not how the world works, is it? In fact, if you go to Lehman's Laws of Software Evolution, you find out that a system has to be continually adapted or it becomes progressively less satisfactory. And we know this intuitively. We love our phones until the next phone comes out. And then all of a sudden our phone's not so cool anymore, is it? And then we get the next phone and it's awesome. And we love it and then the next phone comes out and suddenly it's not so awesome anymore. And we see this across the entire product industry that if something doesn't get a little bit better every day, it does not actually hold our attention, it actually gets worse. And so robust systems, those things that are actually going to not break when they're put under stress, well the only way that we actually know how to do that is to say, you know what, the answer to your change request is no. If we always say no, then the software is going to be incredibly robust, 
but it's not going to be anti-fragile. And so we actually need to find a way to build systems that embrace change. Now, where have we heard that before? Well, as it turns out, you can't spell anti-fragile without agile. Now, we think about architecture that embraces change. What is it that makes change difficult? Well, for the most part, we can relate the difficulty of change back to the notion of coupling. If I could make a change and it only affected the part of the software that I needed to touch, that's actually not that bad. But most of the time I make a change here that breaks something over there and so I go fix that and then that breaks this over here so then I go change that. And what looked like you know, a week-long change turns into a three-month change. And then we have to change all of our tests because our tests are coupled to our code and all of that's broken and we, so we spend weeks actually fixing our test. And this is our collective experience. But we have a lot invested in the monolith. And we try very hard not to fail. Our processes are structured around the notion of preventing failure. And in many cases, the way that we know how to prevent failure, again, is to prevent change. What do we do? Well, we build more process around it, and we build more testing cycles, and more release management, and more approvals, and so forth. And we don't do anything about the coupling. And so as we change the software, it becomes more tightly coupled, and we break things, so what do we do? We don't fix the coupling, we put more process in place. And every time we put more process in place, we slow things down, and we slow things down, we build bigger batch sizes. Bigger batch sizes are riskier. And so, what happens? Fewer releases, because every release is riskier. And so, what do we do? We put as much change as we possibly can into the release, because we might not see another release for two years. This might be the last one. And we repeat that process. And so this is when we come back to microservices. If we just embrace microservices, that's going to fix everything. Well, maybe. What in the world is a microservice? I don't think anybody really knows yet. We might figure out a few years from now. There are some decent definitions floating around. This is probably my favorite one right now. So this notion of a loosely coupled service-oriented architecture with bounded context. Now, why do I like this definition? Because it actually has the word service-oriented architecture in it. Service-oriented architecture is not this evil thing that we're trying to get rid of and replace with the good microservices architecture. In fact, it probably is what service-oriented architecture would have been had we not been so obsessed with figuring out a way to use it to sell middleware. Now, Adrian qualifies that with some very important notions. The first of those is loose coupling. Well, that's exactly what we've been talking about. If we can get rid of the tight coupling, we can actually solve a lot of our problems. And he goes so far as to say it's not even about software module coupling, it's about deployment lifecycle coupling. I should be able to actually deploy my service whenever I want, and I don't have to ask you if it's okay. Just like our muscle cells don't ask us if it's okay to repair themselves after we go to the gym, just like our immune cells don't ask us if it's okay to create antibodies for that germ that we just fought off. How do you create coupling like that? Well, part of that, and I don't have time to break it down, is this notion of bounded context from domain-driven design, but basically the idea that we have a component that encapsulates a specific business capability, and that business capability is bounded. Its responsibility doesn't cross over into other services. It has a contract that defines what comes in and what goes out. And if we structure our system that way, we don't get rid of our problems, we don't get rid of our coupling, but we do make it very explicit when it happens. 
and then we're able to define the rules of engagement for how things can actually come and go. Now you look at microservices, and you look at the way we talk about them, well, they definitely embrace change. They definitely help us to decouple our change cycles. Because they're smaller and we can replace them whenever we want to, we don't have to make them perfect on day one. We can isolate failures into individual microservices. And in fact, we can start to get away from this notion of central planning. We can actually get by with a lot less in the way of governance than maybe we've tried to do in the past. But it's not all unicorns and rainbows, is it? Because we start creating these things called distributed systems. And well cataloged are the eight fallacies of distributed computing. And when we write software, we usually insulate ourselves from the fact that the network is unreliable and that latency is not equal to zero and that bandwidth is not infinite and the network is not secure. The problem is we start to create distributed systems, we start to deploy microservices. The better we get at microservices, the more we find ourselves actually running up against these laws. And so we have to figure out, okay, all the notions of how we built reliability in the past are out the window. We have to figure out how to build now reliable systems from unreliable components. One of the ways that maybe we do that is through the notion of circuit breakers. Circuit breaker is a very simple concept. You have it in your house, it prevents a power spike from over here from damaging everything else. We think of it a little bit differently in a software system is, hey, we put a circuit breaker between me and that other service that I want to talk to. And as long as that service is healthy, the circuit breaker allows me to keep talking to it. But if we notice that it starts to fail when we make calls to it, then eventually we hit some threshold of failures and we trip the breaker and then we start to fail immediately without even engaging with the service. And that notion of failing immediately instead of waiting is the most important thing that we have at our disposal because it allows us to regain control and create some alternate behavior. Remember we talked about the notions of organic systems can adapt? We can start to create systems that are able to adapt. Now, when we get in the Java world, we already have some good frameworks to help us to do this. Hystrix from Netflix happens to be one of those. And I'm going to talk um, a little bit more about Hystrix later this afternoon, not this next session, but the one after that. But okay, let's say we build our microservices and we put these circuit breakers in place. How do we make sure that our anti-fragile system is in fact anti-fragile? How do we make sure that our fault tolerance mechanisms actually work? So there's this notion of injecting faults into production on purpose. And it's actually not new. If you go all the way back to 1975, you had these two uh, scientists, Yao and Chung, and their idea was to insert fake ghost airplanes into the air traffic control system. And the idea is that these ghost airplanes can be monitored, and if the operators of the air traffic control system can safely land the ghost planes, then we can really trust the system. Now, they never actually implemented this, but it is the seed of an idea that through the various years became what's called the Netflix Simeon Army. We start to think about things like Chaos Monkey that runs through the production system and shuts down instances without telling us. Latency Monkey, which inserts itself between components in a system and introduces artificial latency. Why? so that we have the opportunity to practice and see how our system's going to behave in those scenarios when we know we have people sitting there at the ready to actually deal with it, as opposed to waiting until we have an actual failure to test our ability to handle failure, we practice, and we practice in the real environment. 
So when you start to inject faults into production, it forces you to think about error recovery, doesn't it? We no longer have the opportunity to say, well, that system's probably never going to go down, so I don't really have to build a lot of fault tolerance here, do I? No, that system might go down because the chaos monkey might shut it down. And so every place that we cross a boundary, now we are forced to think explicitly about what types of errors are going to occur and how are we going to handle them. And as we do that, and as we introduce automated remediation for those things, it gives us confidence in the system's ability to do what? To maintain homeostasis. Now that homeostasis might be 100% correct operation, or it might have some graceful degradation involved with it, but the notion is the system from the perspective of the user is in fact always working, even though we know that some parts of it are not. And ultimately this contributes to make the system better. Now, at this point in the evolution of software, humans still play an incredibly critical role in the process of understanding and responding to feedback. It's not enough just for us to gather data and build systems that know how to respond to that data. We also have to take that data and analyze it as humans and learn how to not only change the systems, but also feedback change into our engineering processes to better the system. So in this way, humans are still very much a part of the anti-fragility of software. Now, as we said, over time, more advanced AIs, deep learning and so forth might help us get away from some of that. But right now, that's not the case. Okay, so. What's the conclusion of all of this? I don't know. We don't know yet where we're going to end up. And if you look at the last five to 10 years of software development, I don't think most of us would have predicted the world that we find ourselves in today. I don't think most of us would have predicted 10 years ago that we would be talking about the mainstream developer writing distributed systems as a matter of course. I don't think we thought that we would be talking about the notion of intentionally shutting things down in production just to see what would happen. So I don't think we know where we're gonna end up, but I do think it's safe to say that we are starting to learn from the notion of organic systems. And if you look at the software that we're building, it's looking more and more like organic systems. And I think that trend is actually going to continue. And they're gonna look less and less like what we've created in the past. And so we can only hope that as we continue down that trend, that A, systems become more and more anti-fragile and B, the really important goal, is that they're going to embrace that inevitable change that they're going to face, because I think most all of us would agree that change is the one constant. It's one thing that's not actually going anywhere, um, and we're going to be dealing with it for the rest of our careers in this field. So, thank you very much.